Hello again, witches, spooksters, and friends, and thanks for tuning in to my third annual Very Fat Feminist Halloween special. This year, we're looking at some of the ways the stereotypes and archetypes of modern witches has influenced our overall vision of the witch and how that comes up at Halloween. We're also going to talk a bit about Anna Biller's cult horror classic, The Love Witch, and how it reflects back on modern witchcraft and paganism. So let's get spooky! Hey friends, are you ready for Halloween? I am, uh, (laughs) I'm actually embarrassed to say that I have not decorated yet. I'm really hoping that after I get this episode out and then after I collapse into my post-podcast coma, I'll feel a little bit more like digging the, the decorations out. I don't know what's going on. It's been a very weird, weird October. It doesn't feel... I'm not in the Halloween spirit, y'all. Maybe I need to watch The Great Pumpkin or something and really get myself going. So let's dive into our Halloween episode. Every year in these Halloween episodes, I pick a particular aspect of uh, the overall vision of the witch that we see every Halloween and examine how it's influenced modern witches and their practices. In 2016, in the first one, I talked about some of true witchy classics like Black Cats and Eye of Newt, Flying Potions, uh, the Poisy Hats, Green Skin, super fun stuff. And last year, we talked about Victorian spiritualism and theosophy. (laughs) Ugh, theosophy. And um, Madame Blavatsky, seances and spirit communication and even Harry Houdini. This year, I decided to do something a little bit different and look at real modern witches and how they fit into a lot of those witchy stereotypes that we all think of while totally subverting them to be sources of power. At the end of September, I posted on my website the Witchcraft Without a Filter Challenge using the hashtag HowRealWitchesDo. And I asked you guys to show off your real witchy selves and your very real witchy practices. Even the stuff that's not so cute, like your failed spells or your dusty altars from last season. You know, spilled wax everywhere or exploded candle holders, you know, that stuff. The things we don't usually post publicly for everyone to see. On that list, I also put in a very few classic or even kind of ancient witch tools. You know, the stuff that shows up... um, like an old woodblock prints or Goya paintings or something, witches with in Shakespearean monologues. And I was super excited to see how many people shared in general, but especially how many people shared in those categories. I think there's 791 posts so far. We're almost at 800. Uh, I can't believe how many modern witches had cauldrons and brooms and magic wands and how different they all were. Loved it. Uh, these three tools in particular, I mean, there's tons of symbols of the witch. I wanted to include crystal balls as well, but, <laughs> but all of the people I know who use crystal balls are, they're so cool. They're like over the age of 55. They're, <laughs> they're slightly older women and they're much more likely, I've found, to read coffee grounds instead of tea leaves and read tarot with playing cards. Yeah, yeah. It's it's those kinds. So I didn't think a lot of modern people would have big crystal balls. And I think I was actually wrong about that. Maybe next year I'll talk about crystal balls a little bit more. But the the brooms, the wands, and the cauldrons are exactly the things we picture when we picture Halloween witches and wizards. So we see the witches flying their broom across the full moon or three old hags stirring a very menacing looking bubbling cauldron. And everyone from Merlin to Glinda to fairy godmothers are wielding these very gnarly or sparkly magic wands. Super cool. When I worked in metaphysical stores, at least least once a day, someone would stop and gasp in front of the cauldrons or the brooms that we had hanging on the wall, or we had a jewelry case that was full of different wands. And they were always like, oh my god, people don't really use these, do they? And they weren't like freaked out, they were excited. (laughs) They were super excited to find out that magic wands were real. It's like I was making their little witchy dreams come true. It was my favorite. And I mean, you'd you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a witch who actually uses her broom for flying. (laughs) And no one is really slathering flying ointment on a stick and rubbing it 
in their vagina, I hope. Um, I hope. But real witches do actually use brooms in their practice. And the few people I've seen that have them have quite a few. So I actually talked about flying ointments in my first Halloween episode back in 2016. And flying ointments are a salve that are made with poisonous and psychoactive herbs by witches to enter altered states of consciousness for things like spirit communication and astral travel. If you want to know more about them or buy authentic flying ointments, Sarah Ann Lawless is the best source for that. SarahAnnLawless.com is her website. She makes various flying ointments with the actual psychoactive witch herbs like Datura and Belladonna. And she has a lot of info on her website about flying ointments and about these plants in general. So check out her website because it's it's very, very cool. But today we're going to talk about the actual broom. <laughs> Brooms. And yes, I mean, you know, a stick, bristles, brooms. They're used for cleansing and clearing, uh, protection, love spells, attraction and banishing, divination, fertility, uh, family magic, anything to do with family or the home, and also removing obstacles and opening metaphysical doorways. Uh, If you ever go to a pagan or, or a witchy wedding, sometimes called a hand fasting, they still feature this really, really cool thing called jumping the broom. Where there's this beautiful broom, it's it's usually kind of decorative or consecrated. It's often been made specifically for that couple. Uh, after they finish saying their vows, their uh, maid of honor and their groomsmen will hold the broom just, you know, a couple inches off the ground. And the new couple holds hands. Or if they had their hands tied together with a hand fasting cord, they jump over the broom to symbolize jumping into the, their new life together. It's almost like the carrying the wife over the the threshold. It's that kind of ritual. So the broom can be super decorative. Like I said, they're usually custom made. So they'll have the couple's wedding colors in there, or they'll have runes or sigils or their names carved into the handle or wood burned. Uh, They might have herbs or some of the flowers they're using in their ceremony tied around the bristles. And uh, you can even tie like little ribbons with wishes and blessings for a happy marriage from the bridal party onto the the bristles. Really, really cool. And you can find these awesome homemade hand fasting brooms all over Etsy. There's tons of artists there that will make you a custom broom. I mean, it's not going to be cheap, but nothing for your wedding ever is such a money scam. But you'll have this beautiful broom forever. And it's really, really fun. It's just a fun thing. And then later at your wedding, maybe you can do the limbo underneath your fancy broom. Why not? If it's an open bar, why not? So even if you're not getting married, um, or maybe if you did, and now you have this really nice broom, there are tons of magical ways to use your broom in your practice. So to start, you can decorate or anoint or bless any size broom as a talisman for your home or as a ceremonial tool. Uh, I have a full size protection broom with dragon's wood burned on the handle, which I was given. Uh, and I painted it with dragon's blood ink and included things like cinnamon bark and lucky coins and protection crystals. And I used uh, red and black string around it to decorate it. Uh, I also have a small cinnamon broom that I bought in the Christmas aisle <laughs> for cheap uh, that has protective oils uh, outside of just the cinnamon and some herbs tucked in and I have a key that I, you know, infused with kind of privacy type energy. So it doesn't have to be (laughs) a gigantic broom. It can be something really small. And your broom doesn't even have to be some gnarly woody thing with the broom corn or the twigs if that's not what you want. Tess Whitehurst writes about blessing her regular, you know, her plastic house broom. And her vacuum cleaner for magical cleaning so that while she's cleaning, she's also clearing space. Your broom also just doesn't have to be this ceremonial thing. It can be totally practical and it can be anything you want. It doesn't have to look like a stereotypical witch broom if you don't want it to, though those are awesome. (laughs) You can also get like Harry Potter style if you're the same kind of nerd as me. So you can get them in colors that mean something to you or your purposes. You, like I said, you can get a red or black one to use for protection. Or if you want to bring in love or 
passion or creativity, go for like pinks or oranges or reds. You can decorate it with ribbons or string. Uh, you can paint it, you can carve it, you can attach crystal, you can use wires and beads, you can wood burn it, anoint it with oils and bless it and just use it for almost anything. So to actually use the broom to clear space, what you want to do is hold the broom just a couple inches off the ground and do the sweeping motion. But you want to do this with intention. You want to do this in almost like a meditative kind of headspace. You really want to focus in on it. Like I said, you're wielding magic here. So you can focus on cleansing, on clearing, on bringing in good energy. You can do this to cast a circle or to break up negative energy in your home. So the same way that you would use a bundle of sage to go around your house and, you know, get it in all of the corners and underneath the furniture and up into the the stuff, all of the details to make sure all of that negative energy is broken up. You can do that with your broom and, and the bristles on your broom. You can even spray your broom with uh like I said, any sort of magical water or oil, like a Florida water, and just use that almost like your sage to clear space. That's really great if you're not into the smell of sage or if you're not into smoke cleansing in general, the broom can kind of serve that purpose. Uh, You can also clean out a room after you've had an illness, you know, after the flu (laughs) or a cold or something sweeps through your house you can sweep it right the hell out with your broom. You can sweep it out the doors, out the windows, sweep out underneath beds and uh, anywhere where you spent time when you were ill underneath the couch, all of that stuff. You can also use the broom to sweep energy into your house. And its association with weddings and like your home and family life make it really, really great for sweeping in love or marriage, uh, prosperity, abundance, happiness, friends, all of that kind of stuff. So again, you would sweep over your threshold into the house and it can touch the ground if you want, but it doesn't have to. It can be kind of a symbolic sweeping. And imagine yourself just bringing that in. I love having my protection broom like right near my front door. So anytime someone comes in, they pass by this broom and I'm going to be hanging it up so that they'll actually pass under it. But they pass by it and I just kind of imagine the bristles of my broom that are sitting there uh, kind of filtering out any sort of negative energy that they might be bringing in with them. Because we all, I mean, everybody goes out into the world and, and picks up gunk and stuff, spiritual gunk. Everyone's got it. <laughs> Everyone's got spiritual gunk floating around. So I, I imagine the broom just kind of sweeping people's energy on their way in and even out of the house. It's pretty nice. They're also a really great tool for Halloween magic. So Llewellyn has this really cool um, book series called The Witch's Tools. And one of them is The Witch's Broom by Deborah Blake. And I actually reviewed it on the website and gave it four crystal balls out of five. Uh, so she shares a ritual for Samhain or for Halloween using the broom to communicate with spirits. The broom essentially forms a doorway through which spirits or ancestors can enter the world or just interact with us. So after you cast your circle, and she's got a whole really nice spell all written out. I'm going to paraphrase, obviously. Uh, so after casting your circle or getting into a, an appropriate state to communicate with spirits, whatever it is that you normally do to get into a magical safe space, uh, you want to lay the broom on the ground in front of you, you know, horizontally. Um And this is when you would start your meditation, you can chant, you can do an invocation. And what you're trying to do is see a space above your broom there open up and almost like a doorway and imagine being able to speak into it, to call out to someone or to call out to friendly spirits who can offer guidance. So you can look for someone specific. It could almost be like a projection screen or like a window or doorway. So pay attention to anything you see or hear or any sensations that you feel in your body or even up in your third eye. And whenever I invite spirits in, especially around Halloween, um, I mostly work with spirits that I know. I'm so scared of ghosts. Like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm so ridiculous. I'm so scared of ghosts. I just watched um, The Haunting of Hill House, the new one on Netflix, And much like the terrible movie from 1999, I haven't been able to stop, like, 
getting freaked out and seeing stuff from the movie every time I look into a dark corner. It's just driving me nuts. Um, but whenever I invite in spirits, I like to have a small offering there for them. So Halloween is a time in a lot of different traditions and cultures where people essentially feed the ghosts of the dead. Uh, in ancient Egypt, they used to do this. In Mexico, they still do this around the Day of the Dead. They bring um, sweetbreads and uh, cookies and bread and stuff like that made in the shape of bones or skulls. They bring favorite drinks and liquors or coffee. And everyone will eat and drink around the, usually the grave or the tomb, or even at home in front of the altar. But they also leave some there for the spirits. So if you do this, I'd have some snacks or some candy or wine or liquor, depending on who you're trying to invite in. If it's someone that you know specifically, you can get their favorite treat or their brand of scotch or cigarettes or something like that. Um, when you're all done, thank whoever came through for coming through and close down everything the way that you would. Afterwards, put your broom away, bristles up, kind of near your altar and just run your sage over it just to shut down any kind of lingering energy. Really, really cool, right? So uh, The Witch's Broom by Deborah Blake, who is also the author of, what was it, The Everyday Everyday Witchcraft and The Everyday Witch Tarot Deck. So if you're familiar with her work, this book is a lot like hers. It's a very cool, very pagan, very easy to follow take on working with the broom and it includes a lot of really great history and lore about the brooms. It also features a bunch of authors and how they use their. So Tess Whitehurst was in there and Mickey Mueller and Raven Digitalis and they all talk about how they use brooms in their own practices. So it's got a lot of really great ideas. And now the cauldron. The cauldron is a favorite witchy symbol of mine. I love cauldrons. I think they're so cool. And I am very pleased to say that I now know that modern witches love cauldrons. They love them. If you look through the How Real Witches Do hashtag on Instagram, you will see so many photos of cauldrons made out of all different materials and being used in all different ways. It's really, really awesome. In the same Witches Tools series, we have The Witches Cauldron by Laura Tempest Zakroff. So great, by the way. And according to her, the cauldron has nine main uses, or I guess roles, in your magic and ritual. So it serves as the container, the maker, the transformer, the purifier, the gateway, the marker, the drum, divination, and rebirth. And when you think about it, that's Sounds like a lot, but it's so true. Your cauldron can hold your magical materials. It can be the space where you actually mix up, mix up and, and make your whatever it is, your blends, your potions. Within it, you can use fire or water to transform or purify the things that you are putting into it. Like um, you can transform petition papers. You can cleanse certain things in smoke or in water through your cauldron. The gateway and the marker, the gateway is the cauldron works in a similar way to the broom. It can open up a space for communicating with the spirit world. The marker is really great. In the, in the book, she describes using a bunch of smaller cauldrons to mark things like uh, the directions or the elements and having them in that that classic symbol just really adds a really great amount of energy. And then we have divination and rebirth, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So <laughs> there are lots of different cauldrons out there. Um, small altar top cauldrons that are like the size of a, the size of like a kind of big cereal bowl. If you can imagine that these are really popular in the tag and in general. Uh, and they're really, really great for any sort of spells or rituals that you do solo or in groups because they, they fit right on the tabletop. They're awesome for burning incense or herbs or petition papers. You can put your charcoal disc right inside your cauldron with, I, I put some sand under it or something, but you can put your charcoal disc in there. You can burn your herbs. You can burn your petition papers. You can throw things into it and you have a totally fire safe container as long as you're using a fire safe container. <laughs> they also, of course, hold any sort of liquid, 
as long as it's made to hold liquid. Uh, it holds candles, and they make really, really great scrying bowls. Large cauldrons and pots can be used for all of those things, but you can also add in kitchen-type magic, like making magical food and drinks. My cauldron, <laughs> it's from a kitchen store. It's the best mashed potato pot that my parents ever bought. It's so great. The, the lid twists to lock on, and it's got... um. It's got holes, so you don't need a colander or anything. It's got good handles on either side so that you can dump it. And I use it for both magic, and I also use it when I'm cooking for family and friends or special occasions. I clean it out very well in between uses, and I don't put anything in it that could linger and get into food afterwards. I'm, I'm pretty picky about it. I also use it for ciders as or tea, and if I'm at a witchy occasion, that can be my punch bowl. But I love using it with any sort of uh, charcoal disc, candles, fire, anything like that, because the lid can go on very quickly and just lock on. So every time something has gotten out of hand, and it's only happened twice, I just misjudged how high a flame would get. Um, I was able to just put that lid right on and, and carry the cauldron outside so I can put it down. And that always makes me feel safe and like I can always use my cauldron for anything. I can always rely on my mashed potato cauldron. <laughs> I love it. And in the tag, I saw a lot of other people also use giant pots and Dutch ovens and things for their own cauldron. Sometimes they're cast iron and sometimes they're just metal. Really neat. Um, if you're into divination and psychic work, and especially with Halloween and sound coming up, the cauldron is a really, really cool way to stretch your psychic muscles. So I mentioned a scrying bowl. The, a black cauldron, especially one with a very black bottom, like it has to be solid black, filled with blessed water doubles as what's called a scrying bowl or a scrying mirror. A scrying mirror is a black mirror. It's usually made of glass or even sometimes obsidian. The obsidian mirrors are truly beautiful and incredible. They're made in Mexico, and if you ever see one, I highly recommend getting your hands on it. It's just... It's got such an incredible, I love obsidian. It's got such a really incredible energy to it. Anyways, you're, you're scrying mirror a bowl. You gaze into the surface of the water, the very still surface of the water. That's very dark to divine messages or, or have visions. If that's something that you think your brain is possible. It's like a crystal ball. God. Oh, I love crystal balls. I really want one. <laughs> like, and I mean like a big one, a clear one with like a gold stand that has dragons on it or some shit. So bad. One day, one day you'll come into my house and there will just be a big crystal ball <laughs> sitting on my living room table. Okay, so if you have a cauldron that is a dark solid color and straight up, you can use a plastic cauldron for this because you're just filling it up with water. A nice glass or ceramic or cast iron one would be better, but you can use a plastic one. And you want to fill this up with a blessed water and set it on your altar. To bless your water, you can bless it yourself and say a little prayer over top. You can add salt. You can add a blessed water like um, rose water or Florida water. You can also use water that you collect during the full moon. So the full moon was what, two nights ago? If you collected any water there, you can use some of that for your, your scrying water. Uh, turn off all the lights. You want to light at least one candle, but... I like to have a few off to the side so it doesn't obscure my view, but it does definitely, it makes the surface of your glass darker and more solid uh, without completely freaking you out <laughs> and making your eyes just, you know, not work. So cast your circle, get into a meditative state, and then peer into the surface of the black water in your cauldron. And notice if you see anything on the surface or if you feel anything when you look onto this, this blank canvas here. You can also use that water to catch wax. So it's called ceromancy. There's such fun names for divination. Uh, ceromancy is the art of dripping wax into cold water and interpreting the shapes that it creates. Almost like um, how you would interpret the shapes in a uh, tea leaf reading. You can also do a similar practice with all with oil. And in Italian folk magic, they use olive oil and a bowl of water to help diagnose the evil eye. So a witch or whatever, the matriarch of the family here will drip a few drops of olive oil into a bowl or a pot of water. 
And if the oil drops all stay together, there's no supernatural cause for the problems that are happening with this person right now. But if the oil splits and moves to opposite ends of the bowl, that person's been hit with the evil eye. <laughs> so cool. And uh, so reading the shapes that you see in the water would take some time and you have to figure out exactly what shapes mean what to you because <laughs> you can find some guides online but it's all going to be very individual. But that's a really interesting way of reading and using some of the materials you already have. You don't have to go out and buy anything. And if you're already burning candles and you find yourself with a pressing question, you can very quickly use Ceromancy and that magic candle already has the energy that you're asking your question about, right? I find it it's really helpful. You can also, um, in your cauldron, you can burn herbs, um, or you can put a candle in there and you can practice smoke reading where you read the shape made of the smoke coming up from a magical flame or flame reading if you're very confident and you feel safe enough to try that. I don't do that because if, if I burn my house down, I'll be so mad. <laughs> uh, lastly, your cauldron can be your magical mixing bowl that you use to create magic potions, herb blends, salts or baths or foods and drinks. It doesn't have to be a big black cast iron round pot with little legs or anything either. Your cauldron could be brass or copper, could be made of granite or metal like mine is, mine is just steel, could be a teapot. If you make a lot of teas, if you make a lot of magical teas, and if you like to make potions, a teapot is an awesome cauldron. And you can get teapots that look like a big black cauldron, or you can get teapots that feature really, really cool motifs, like that use colors that indicate things like, um, psychic energy or love or that have certain flowers painted on them and you can look up what their magical uses are. You can have a lot of fun finding a teapot as a cauldron. Uh, you can use a very large ceramic bowl. I have a large dark blue ceramic bowl with stars inside and I often use that in place of a cauldron. Or as one very amazingly clever witch on Instagram shared, the compost pile. <laughs> she has a very large garden. And she uses a lot of the things in her garden in her practice. And so she posted a picture of her compost pile because this is where she mixes up a lot of the ingredients that she uses in her everyday life, in her garden. Uh, it nourishes all of her magical plants as well as, you know, her food, her flowers, her whatever she has. So the compost pile really hits all of the markers of a cauldron. It's used for mixing, combining, holding. Uh, you can bless your compost pile, obviously, and it creates something new. It transforms everything you put into it into something that you can use for your own means. I thought that was an awesome take on the cauldron. I think that was probably one of the coolest posts I saw all month. Um, but I loved all the entries I saw of cauldrons. Um, a lot of you use pots intended for cooking like I do, which is cool and really is the modern cauldron. Cauldrons, the ones we imagine used to be for actually cooking or washing, they use them for everything. So if you use a regular cooking pot, this is your modern cauldron. And a lot more of you have those cool tabletop cast iron cauldrons than I would have guessed. And I'm very jealous. I have a teeny tiny one, but I obviously need to get one of these medium sized ones. I think my, my favorite one of those was actually this little pretty cauldron with a cat face on it. And I, I mean like a Parisian Moulin Rouge absinthe ad era cat face. And it had a lot of sentimental, sentimental value to the poster. And I swear you could feel this awesome like love energy oozing out of the photo like coming up out of my phone screen and i just i thought it was really really cute really pretty uh finally we come to the magic wand <laughs> and wands are a hard sell for a lot of mar modern witches and i'm not sure exactly why that is Maybe it's because of the fantasy element or because a lot of wands are really cool, twisty wood pieces that might not appeal to someone with different tastes. Or maybe it's just because people don't actually know what to do with it. Uh, I'll be honest, wands have never really been my thing. Uh, I don't even really point with one finger and instead I use my entire hand and I usually cover it in oils and I use that to direct energy. 
But this is the main purpose of your wand, to direct your magical energy. And the materials your wand is made of can help boost that specific type of energy you're working with, or maybe even just boost you in general. I have an entire box of wands made out of really nice wood in a range of beautiful natural colors that look straight out of a Harry Potter movie or even something like Lord of the Rings. And I swear to God, I couldn't even give them away. No one was really interested. They all looked at them. They thought they were very, very cool, very interesting. They didn't know people still used wands, you know, but they weren't for them. But crystal wands, oh, huge. Everyone loves crystal wands. And it's because there are so many beautiful wands out there made out of a hundred different types of crystals in all these different styles, all for different purposes. But the goal is the same to concentrate and direct your own personal magic energy. I love a lot of the ways you can find crystal wands. Of course, you can find a wand carved from one piece of crystal. You can also find wands that include a lot of different crystals, all attached together, uh, for lack of a better term. They're glued, but you know, and it will usually include a couple of crystals that resonate with a certain energy. So I saw one at the store I worked at that had rose quartz and it was, a okay, so it was a rose quartz handled wand and it had copper, I believe, or silver and a ring of garnets around it. And at the top, there was like a little clear quartz crystal ball. And at the bottom, you had a quartz crystal point. And the tag that it came with said it was for specifically for love magic or sending out love to others. And all of those crystals really work great for that purpose. It was really beautiful. It looked like the transforming wand in Sailor Moon. I think I talked about it before. But it was so beautiful and I think it sold out real quick. <laughs> um, I've seen people use wands while activating crystal grids or opening and closing circles, offering blessings towards certain people. So they're directing their energy at a certain person or drawing symbols or sigils in the air. I had a pranic healing session one time and the woman used this really, really fancy quartz Vogel wand. Vogel is a style of wand. It's very expertly carved very expensive. And when I asked what she used it for, of course, she directs energy to certain places on your body with it. But she also found that the very precise carving and, and symmetry of the Vogel helped her penetrate deep with energy into various points in the chakra system. So most people know the seven main chakras and using the wand to direct energy to or from your own chakras is, is very, very cool. But we also have like billions of little tiny micro chakras everywhere, which she explained to me. That's the first time I ever heard that. Uh, and she used this wand to both find, like detect and heal those very specific little spots. It was such an interesting new age version of the classic magic wand. I've never forgotten that. And every time I see one of those wands, I think about it. And I think about how much like feeling and sensation I really had during that healing session. That wand clearly does something. And I think my favorite way that modern witches have turned the magic wand trope on its head is with crystal sex toys. Not only are sex toys made out of rose quartz or obsidian, just like really pretty, <laughs> just so pretty, but they combine the energy of crystal healing in magic with your own very personal energy. What's great about this is that it hits a few kind of ideas and stereotypes about witches, including the overall sexualization of the people that were accused of witchcraft. So sex has always been used to demonize all women, really, and witches, and uh, often very average displays of beauty or sexuality were seen as like inherently evil, like red lipstick. Modern witches have taken that idea and instead of... and it's no longer something shameful. They channeled that sexual energy into something different while healing themselves. I have a rose quartz wand of this nature. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's a very interesting and wonderful type of tool. <laughs> and I'm going to try to get through this without giggling. I promise, but I can't promise I'll succeed. So I've never been a big fan of rose quartz in general. I didn't really get the whole vibe. You know, I just didn't get it. Um, 
And when I first got this wand, I mean, I just giggled and I stuck it in my nightstand drawer and it sat there for a really long time. And one day I just took it out and I just, you know, I held on to it. I was just, you know, playing with it in my hand and drawing stuff on my arms with the really cool, smooth surface of the stone, just thinking about how pretty it was. I, I love the color and it has lots of, um, rose quartz is much more interesting than it looks. It looks like it's just, you know, solid pink, but it's really got all of these different lines and design on the inside. Really pretty. I couldn't stop looking at it and thinking about how pretty it was. So I, I afterwards I put it on my nightstand and I started looking at it all the time. And it made me smile. After a while, I decided to use it for its intended purpose. And although the fact that it's hard and like hard and cold like glass <laughs> was a bit of a shock uh, and something to get used to if that's not what you're used to. Uh, but now it's like second nature. Uh, every time I use it, I feel like there's some small, dark, scared part of myself that had issues with sex or romance and bodies just kind of floating away. Every time I use it, it's like I like myself a little bit more. And the wand. <laughs> I absolutely love this wand. I'm holding it right now. It's clean. Don't worry. I'm holding it right now because it makes me feel very like happy and joyful and confident. So, Sometimes I've noticed lately that when I'm doing magic in my room, on my altar, near my nightstand, I will grab this thing and I will use it to direct energy or to kind of draw magical symbols in the air. And I didn't even realize I was doing it the first time. So I finally found a wand that I really like. And I think I'm going to try other crystals. And I think I'm also going to try other wands of a uh, not so sexual nature. <laughs> then again, Maybe not because, okay, so if you're interested in the, in the crystal sex toys, I did not buy mine from the good company that makes them, with it, which is Shock Rubs. I bought mine just on a site like eBay <laughs> just because I was curious and I didn't want to pay a lot of money in case I never used it. So Shock Rubs, shockrubs.com, this is where you want to go to get an idea of what these wands, what these tools are all about, to see how they work, to see what it is about them that people like so much. And you can even find information about how to use them. And the creator of Shock Rubs also wrote a book called Crystal Healing and Sacred Pleasure that can help you get into the process of your using your crystal sex toy. Very cool. Uh, some of the other great posts that I saw in the hashtag for wands were People with copper rings on their index fingers as copper is conductive. They, I also saw a full wand made out of copper pipe and wire and crystals. And I think there were herbs inside the pipe. I also saw a lot of crystal wands that are not sex toys uh, in mediums like selenite. Uh, a friend of mine has one that's in galaxyite. That's really, really nice. I also saw finger tattoos or nail art that featured magic symbols. And those are used as a wand. Um, and even just photos of people's hands and talking about how they direct their own energy. Very cool. And a few people did have really pretty, really gorgeous uh, wooden wands. Some with added crystals or decorations. And some were just really nicely carved. Some were very Harry Potter style. It was neat how different it all is. And I liked that some people had these kind of classic wands that they used all the time. And I liked seeing those pictures right next to all of these brand new crystal and metal wands. It was very, very interesting. So thank you so much to everyone who shared. And even if you haven't, it's never too late. You can do this anytime. <laughs> it doesn't just have to be October. So you can find the whole challenge and the list of photo prompts on my website at thefatfeministwitch.com. And you can search the hashtag how real witches do on Instagram and even Twitter to see what other people are posting. Okay, let's move on to another pretty common stereotype about witches, that we're all Satan worshippers. Since time immemorial, the modern witch has been bombarded with one very annoying question. So, do you like worship Satan? <laughs> to which the common response is usually like a laugh or a snort, and <laughs> some version of witches don't actually worship Satan, dude. 
I've said it myself a number of times, but unfortunately, there are satanic witches, and we've all been throwing them under the bus for ages. That's just not fair. And in recent years, satanic organizations like the Satanic Temple have gotten a lot of media coverage for their inclusive messages and fights against religious discrimination and championing, championing the right for anyone to access safe and legal abortions. They're also metal as fuck, obviously. <laughs> Satan loves heavy metal. Um, even on TV, it's much more common now to see witches devoted to Satan, and satanic witches can even be the protagonists of the stories. So Salem, a TV show which was on a few years ago, I think it ended, essentially brought to life all of the scary witchcraft laid out in a very old book called the Malleus Maleficarum, which was actually used to hunt witches during the trials. And I don't just mean in Salem, I mean in Europe beforehand. Uh, and these witches in Salem had familiars, they worked blood magic, they had to have sex with Satan as part of their initiation, and none of that would have made it onto t TV 10 years ago at all. Today on Netflix, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina TV Show Part 1 goes up. And this isn't based on the Sabrina Spellman that you remember from 90s TV, but it is still Sabrina Spellman. Um, but it's based on a comic of the same name, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which I highly recommend and did review on the blog before. Sabrina's family are devout members of a satanic coven they call the Church of Night, who often summon demons and eat human flesh, which is why they live in a funeral home. <laughs> so the show starts with Sabrina's 16th birthday, where she has to decide to either dedicate herself to Satan and get the full course of her magical powers or renounce Satan and essentially lose her magic, which not a super great deal. Are we right? Um, and this is kind of an overall theme when it comes to Satanism. So let's talk Satan. <laughs> uh, as it turns out, there are as many different kinds of Satanists as there are circles of hell. We've got Satanists, devil worshippers, Luciferians, and really only some of them actually practice any sort of magic, and most of them don't even believe that the devil is real. A lot like witchcraft and, and some paganism, Satanism can be atheistic or secular, so you don't believe in any deities, or it can be theistic. Basically, you have Satanists who do not believe Satan is a deity or a real person, uh, and they do not worship him as such, but they follow a life path that is in line with the tenets of Satanism, which was inspired by the story of Satan. Then, of course, there are those who see Satan and Lucifer as deities and worship them, and they can be their main god, or they can be one god in a whole mix of polytheistic deities. I mean, people can worship Satan and Lucifer and also Aphrodite <laughs> and also, you know, anyone else really. So it's a lot more common now to find people who are comfortable talking about Satan, about Lucifer and about sharing the story. And it's very interesting. So most of the Satanists that you meet will still be the atheistic type, even if they're also witches. Anton LaVey was the creator of the Church of Satan in the 1960s, and our modern satanic temple is different from Anton LaVey and his version of Satanism, but they're both examples of atheistic Satanist organization. They see the story of Satan as something to be inspired by. They see him as an archetype or as a symbol. They're still religions, but they're based on rational thought and empathy, uh, non-judgment, free will, and usually less harsh and dogmatic views of sex or of sin in general. The Satanic Temple in the U.S. has become really super popular because of their fights for religious freedom, like the statue of Baphomet uh, that they wanted to put up on the courthouse lawn, and after-school Satan programs are really cool. Uh, personal rights, abortion rights, and other issues of bodily autonomy in general, because the Satanic Temple believes one of their tenets is that uh, the personal body is like inviolable. So they're very much against anti-choice groups. And in general, they just kind of rebel against the religious right and of that dogmatic control on people's lives. And this has really updated the vision of the modern Satanists from Anton LaVey, who 
was a little bit more weird orgies and devil horns and capes and drinking out of big chalices. <laughs> so it's upgraded that a little bit from that to more of a social activist who fights for the underdog. Now, I'm not t talking shit about Anton LaVey. I want to stress that right now. And as I understand it, they had a character called Anton LaVey in the newest American horror story that a lot of people were upset about because it showed him as a theistic Satanist. And he was very much against theism. He was a he was an atheistic guy and he was about rational thought and he liked the imagery um the sexuality of the occult, but he didn't actually believe in these supernatural things. So a lot of people were pretty bummed about that representation. He is, or was, a very, very interesting man. So if you grew up learning about Christianity or, or in a Christian church, uh, this might seem kind of odd. Uh, within Christianity, Satan doesn't really have redeeming qualities. I mean, he's just a dick, right? He let his ego get out of hand, he rioted against God, and he was kicked the fuck out. That's the story. But of course, there are three sides to every story, and even more if magic or religion is involved. So this is where Lucifer comes in. Lucifer and Satan are actually two different guys. <laughs> did you guys know that? I did not. So it's all a little bit jumbled, but, but in general, Lucifer as a name really only appeared once in the King James version of the Bible. And Lucifer wasn't a demon and he wasn't the opposite of God. He was one of God's angels. And if you've seen the Kevin Smith movie Dogma, <laughs> I'm sure you know part of this story. Or if you've read Paradise Lost, I guess. Uh, so in Hebrew, Lucifer means light bringer. And he was said to be so good and so beautiful that he shone bright like a star. He was also referred to as the morning star after this point. Lucifer is the angel, apparently, who lets his hubris get in the way of his job in obedience to God. And a great war breaks out. And because Lucifer is charming and sexy and <laughs> shines like a star, he converted other angels to his side. Lucifer lost and was cast out of heaven, and angels don't really get to be angels if they're not hooked up with the home office. So <laughs> they were sent down to earth along with Lucifer. He was stripped of his physical form, and they were all cast into this plane of existence that is known as hell or the underworld or whatever you want to think of it as. So in this form now, Lucifer has been transformed and he's Satan or the devil or the great dragon. He no longer has a physical form of his own. He's not a thing. He's not a person. He just is. He's energy. And that energy specifically is, being, is seen as being the opposite of the energy in, of God. And something about this story, I don't know. No one could ever explain to me why he actually rebelled against God. No one Christian could explain to me why he actually rebelled against God. It was just hubris. It was just ego. He just didn't like the deal and he wanted something else, but he was an angel man. <laughs> he was an angel. So uh, the book of Revelation actually talks a little bit about the war in heaven. I found this really cool piece that describes it. Uh, the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. <laughs> Wacky. Uh, Old Testament God was just like, man, he didn't take shit. Uh, so according to Satanic and Luciferian mythology, Lucifer's complaints were a little bit more complex than, I just don't want to do this anymore. And they began with the creation of us humans. Lucifer, you know, looking down, apparently saw these fresh, stupid, pink little things that God created that were basically just rooting around in their own filth on this planet. But he noticed that they had something that he didn't. And that was free will. The ability to decide their own fate their own allegiance, and their own life path. They were not slaves to God, like Lucifer started to feel like he was. And then he noticed that even though these humans had free will, they were still expected to be at the total mercy of these rules from God. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge. You know, they preach sexual abstinence and chastity, 
God's love for both angels and humans seemed to come with a lot of fine print. (laughs) And Lucifer was no longer content being God's favorite angel. And, you know, maybe he wanted to be a God, wanted to have God's job. But a lot of Satanists believe that what he really wanted was the power to be powerful, to be his own source of power, to use his own mind and his soul and his magic. And he thought that everyone should have this too. Not just lip service of free will, but real and true free will. And this is what started the war. And in this story, Lucifer is a lot more like Prometheus from Greek mythology or Lilith, who were rebelling against, you know, the authority to make their own choices, to be their own people, and oftentimes to join the humans on the earthly plane. In Greek mythology, Prometheus stole fire from the gods up on Mount Olympus because he saw us freezing and starving to death while the gods just sat up there and laughed at us for being too stupid to understand fire. When Prometheus brought us the fire and essentially saved us from extinction, he was punished by being hung upside down from a mountain while crows ate how his innards for ever. Awful. Uh, Lilith was the first wife of Adam in Hebrew mythology, and she refused to be subjugated by her husband. And so she was cast out of paradise long before Eve ever ate that apple from the tree of knowledge. And sometimes she's known as the first demon, or the first vampire, or the first witch, because she decided that she would be her own person. But I always thought it was it was odd, <laughs> it was odd, that Eve actually got in trouble for eating the apple from the tree of knowledge. And I know it was presented to her by the devil, but why would it be evil for a human person, a woman, to seek the knowledge of the universe? That doesn't seem like it's such a bad problem. And it's just because God said, don't. (laughs) But he did that on purpose. You know, he put them in the garden with the tree to tempt them and then just said, don't, and just expected them to, to follow. And so when you think of it that way, I mean, I absolutely would have eaten the apple. (laughs) Absolutely. I can live here and not see anything else of the world and live as some as what someone else wants me to be. Or I can open myself up to the whole universe. I mean, no question. No question. So that makes you think of Satan in a slightly different uh, way. Both Satanists and those who work with the story of Lucifer specifically instead see him as a source of enlightenment and a champion of free will. Those who combine these beliefs with magic or witchcraft sometimes say they follow a left-hand path versus a right-hand path, which is really just black magic and white magic by another name. In general, their practice and witchcraft doesn't look much different from anyone else's, but they tend to be more comfortable working with the themes presented in the story of Lucifer and the devil, like free will, sexuality, uh, darkness and disobedience and kind of shadow qualities, um, empowerment and enlightenment, social justice, uh, cursing and hexing, and are more comfortable working with mediums like blood or urine or grave dirt or poisonous plants. A friend of mine uh, also works with animals. She she has pets. She has black cat, tarantula, a snake, and she uses the shed skin and fur from these pets to make potions and oils and mojo bags. So she has black cat oil and she has tarantula oil. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and she de- dresses and decorates and, um, I don't know, spells <laughs> chicken feet. Uh, she uses a spirit board and communes with the dead. And I mean, she also likes heavy metal and bad movies and is a saucy Libra. She's badass. Uh, But if I had to describe what her practice really entailed, I'd just say that she's more comfortable or more in tune with the darker side of life and magic in the universe. She's more comfortable with death and likewise rebirth and regeneration. She's someone who reinvents herself. Uh, She's done it a hundred times and it seems like she gets stronger and stronger every time. She's also very empathic and non-judgmental and just thinks everybody should live the life that they think is best and that they should let her live her life the way it's best. And that's pretty important to her character and her practice. She's a really interesting person. And Satanism in general is a really, really interesting topic. I love rebels and I love free will. It's all, it's what I'm all about, right? So 
if thou wouldst like to live deliciously, uh, consider adding Satan or Lucifer into your deity or archetype rotation. Maybe you can even work with counterparts like the story of Lilith or Prometheus, or if you like animal guides, work with snakes or snake energy. I found a couple of really cool books uh, about this topic if you want to learn a little bit more. The first one is The Luminous Stone by Michael Howard, which talks about Lucifer's place in Western occult tradition. So it kind of extrapolates on everything I've talked about here. And the other is The Devil's Dozen by Gemma Gary, which is specifically about working magic with the devil as an old world god. So that has actual spells and rituals. You can also still find copies of Anton LaVey's books like The Satanic Bible and The Satanic Witch. But I want you to remember when they were written. <laughs> and as far as the satanic witch goes, <sighs> female and woman's empowerment has come a very, very long way since this time. And it involved a lot of very overt sexuality that kind of crossed a line sometimes from being empowering to being objectifying. So remember that when you're reading The Satanic Witch, you know, all your power doesn't have to come from sexuality, but it is still a very interesting book. Like I said, uh, Anton LaVey was just a very interesting guy in general. There's also a really great documentary. Um, it's a documentary based on rumors, but it's, it's fantastic. It's called Mansfield uh, 66 slash 67 you know, 666. Um, and it's about Jane's Ma Jane Mansfield, the actress whose daughter is Mariska Hargitay from SVU. <laughs> um, and her, first of all, her life as a sex symbol and her attitudes about sex and her friendship with Anton LaVey. She took a lot of pictures at the Satanic Temple and she, er, sorry, at his Church of Satan. And she was friends with him. They she thought he was an interesting and really intelligent guy. And Jane Mansfield was, she had like genius level IQ, like over 160 or something like that. So it's a really neat documentary. I found it on Hoopla, which is connected to my library. So I got to watch it for free. But I highly recommend that as well. So that's the modern satanic witch. But the vision of the witch aligned with Satan really mostly exists in texts like the Malleus Maleficarum which taught people how to hunt and kill witches. It was all the worst things you could imagine about witches. And a lot of that just isn't true. So in this book, you'll see the woodcut prints of the, the witches riding broomsticks and sacrificing humans and kissing Satan's shapely ass, you know, just, just classic witchy things. And that's really the only place that that existed. As far as anyone can tell, there really weren't satanic witches in antiquity. None of those witches that were burned at the stake in Europe or hanged or any of that, as far as anyone can tell, were genuinely aligned with Satan. But lots of philosophers, poets, artists, and occultists, and members of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society worked with Lucifer in his form as a light bringer and a symbol of empowerment. I believe she even had a regular pamphlet that came out called Lucifer. But they'd never have considered themselves practitioners of a left-hand path. And it's because Satan is not automatically evil or devilish. It's just the way that you look at it. In terms of Christianity, everything Satan stands for is the opposite of them. But it's not like all of Christianity's beliefs and ideals are best for everybody. A lot of, it, a lot of Christianity is about love and loving each other and treating each other with respect and helping other people. But a lot of it is also about rules and structure and making rules about how you can live your life. And Satanists are just about opening that up and saying, I think people can decide how to live their own lives and decide their own ethics. That's amazing. So I'm very interested in Satanists now. <laughs> And I, I love watching the, the protests and things put on by the Satanic Temple. The former head of the Detroit Satanic Temple, her name is Jex Blackmore. She's so cool. Uh, she put on amazing protests to protest um, anti-choice abortion groups. And I actually posted a little broadly mini documentary about one of her protests in a post on my website called Witch Docs, Witch Documentaries, that I highly recommend checking out. 
she's a very interesting person and she describes a little bit about why abortion is uh is an issue for satanists so i highly recommend checking that out now i know we've been having some fun but it's actually been a really hard and serious few weeks since my last episode in world news um If you follow any sort of North American news and you follow the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings in the U.S., you know that the Me Too movement and that sexual assault and the free pass that a lot of abusers and assaulters get is a very popular topic right now. Even in the pagan witch community. Um, One of my favorite online witches who I mentioned earlier, Sarah Ann Lawless, fellow Canadian, Posted a long entry to her website recently called So Long and Thanks for All the Abuse, a History of Sexual Trauma in the Pagan Community that detailed various instances of sexual abuse or assault that she and others have experienced at the hands of respected members and elders of her local pagan communities in both British Columbia and Ontario. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Just a warning If this kind of subject matter, talking about sexual abuse, uh, sexual trauma, abuse against children, if any of that really bothers you, please don't listen to the next few minutes or listen with a grain of salt because some some of what I'm going to talk about might be triggering for you. Uh, So though Sarah initially held back names, (laughs) after a few of the accused abusers actually left comments on her post, which I thought was like... I mean, the audacity. She actually started to reveal their identities. And that opened a real can of worms. Uh, Since then, the pagan chaplain, or the Wiccan chaplain, I I think, at the University of Alberta has resigned because of all of the allegations coming out now that Sarah has gone public. And the head of the Wiccan Church of Canada in Toronto had to step down from his position, or felt he had to step down from his position, after he fully victim blamed Sarah and talked about her poor decision making in the comments of her post. It was disgusting and really offensive. The whole list uh, was full of people that have been members of the pagan community for a long time, and some are pretty well known. Uh, Another name on that list, who she was in a abusive relationship with was Mojo, who was one of the hosts of the Wiggly and Way podcast, which is a very big Canadian podcast that's been on for years. I used to listen to it in the early days of my podcast listening. So I know that a lot of you witches have come to witchcraft while completely circumventing the pagan community. So some of this might not resonate with you or might not sound very significant or familiar. But for a time, you couldn't find witches that were not pagan. And so these communities and festivals and Sabbath gatherings and stuff were really all witches had if they wanted to connect with each other. As I am kind of wary about big groups I don't know in general, I didn't go to a lot of these things. I didn't go alone for sure. I didn't start going until I found a group of people that I I felt I could really trust and that weren't sketchy. That was important. Um, And for a long time, I even like actively avoided every single male presenting person at pagan functions because I just noticed like just how they interacted with women. There was just a a disturbing lack of propriety and there was lots of touching and sexual comments and stuff that made a lot of people uncomfortable, but they just kept doing it. And the worst is when I saw people like this interacting with younger women and it just, it was just icky and it happened all the time. So for years, I refused to go to those full weekend festivals. And even though that sounds like fun, like I am all about stripping down naked and eating a bunch of pot cookies or mushrooms and dancing naked under the full moon around a fire. I'm down with that. That is all I love. But I don't love to do that around a whole group of people I don't know who are also intoxicated, especially in these communities where I know that there are predators. The only time I went to one of those, I actually found one that was family friendly. And I'm not really into kid stuff so much, but it was much less sketchy. (laughs) So that was how I did that. Um, Various covens and groups in local pagan communities are just full of serial predators. And in general, just old creeps looking to take advantage of the fact that A, a lot of witches practice in the nude. And B, witchcraft is very popular with young people, especially younger women. 
There have even been um, big name pagans that have been arrested and convicted or that we know committed horrific crimes. Um, Kenny Klein was a someone the pagan community knew and he was a musician. He was actually arrested and charged with child pornography. And Marion Zimmer Bradley, the author of The Mists of Avalon, which this really bums me out because I used to love that book. Um, it's come out that she was a disgusting, incestuous pedophile who abused her own children and allowed other adults in her local pagan community to do the same. Really awful. So awful. Uh, her daughter has written a lot about it, and it's hard to read. These are extreme sounding situations, but they've been so common. That story has happened over and over and over. And it's not just satanic panic type stuff. This stuff really happens. And this is a really important topic. Like I said, I know it's kind of heady, but it's so important that I changed this episode a little bit. That's why I'm, that's why I'm posting it so late. I'm just ridiculous. Um, I had planned to talk about all of the fun, cute, pretty looking witchy things in the movie, The Love Witch, that are taken from real witchcraft. Because Anna Biller, the director and the writer and the one who made the whole movie, she really did a lot of incredible research for that movie. There is so much in it that was taken directly from Wiccan texts and real Wiccan traditional rituals and things like that. But instead of talking about all of that stuff, I've decided to focus on one element of the film. There's still going to be spoilers, so beware a little bit. Um, but the character of Gayen, who is the leader of the lead character, Elaine's coven. He's also the quintessential dirty old pagan man who wears robes and thinks he's the reincarnation of Aleister Crowley. He's icky. And I mean... Bless the actor because he played it so well and he really makes you feel pretty slimy. Uh, <laughs> this pagan predator idea, it's such a trope that it actually made it into this film because it draws on experiences and stories from real witches and, and all women, really. So The Love Witch, which I highly recommend, by the way, tells the story of Elaine a young witch who's looking for a fresh start in this really cute uh, California town after the mysterious death of her ex-husband, Jerry. Elaine is hyper-focused on love, specifically being loved by a man. At one point, she says, I guess you could say I'm addicted to love with this very scary look on her face. Perfect. <laughs> uh, she uses sex magic to create love magic with scary and often fatal resu results, of course. The movie's amazing. The sets and everything are beautiful. There's tons of, of like witchy themed artwork that I wish I had in my own home. And it's a lot and a lot of fun. But this issue of, of sexual assault in the pagan and witch communities does come up. And on your first watch, you'll probably hate Elaine. She is, <laughs> she is so, so obsessed with finding a man and being the ultimate fantasy for Ben so that she can be loved. And it feels really sickening. But as the film goes on, it shows you all of the reasons Elaine thinks this way and how she ended up this way. And as you can guess, the men in her life have used, abused, hurt, and discarded her forever. One of the men in her life is Gayen, who along with Barbara, who I think it's supposed to say that it never says explicitly that Barbara is his girlfriend or his partner or his wife or anything, but as far as I can tell, they are partners. Either way, they are both the high priest and priestess of Elaine's coven. Uh, and they initiated Elaine into witchcraft. At first, when she mentions Gayen and Barbara, I mean, she talks about them like they saved her life, their treasured mentor and friends. But as soon as we actually meet Gayen on screen, we see Elaine's face fall and become hard. She flinches when he touches her. And she stands really stiff while he takes these gross liberties with her body. He does this whole Wiccan, like, five-point body kiss where he kisses her, like, breasts and stuff. And he does this in public. Ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And Barbara, despite being Elaine's good friend, never registers her friend's discomfort or says anything to gain about it. 
And as they're talking about, you know, what they're doing these days, he starts talking about the kind of magic classes he teaches. And one of these classes is sex magic, of course. (laughs) To which Elaine responds with that same hard look on her face. Oh, are you still teaching that? Mm Mm-hmm. Very telling. Uh, Shortly after, a couple of very young women, um, I think their names are Star and her sister Moon. They're really cute, like these cute blonde girls. Um, But they're very young and they're from his sex magic class. And they come to the burlesque club that they're at because they just hang out at the burlesque club for drinks in their witchy apparel. And I love it. Um, (laughs) He proceeds to explain to them that a woman's power lies in her sexuality. And the way he talks, I mean, he just acts like it's so subversive to wear your hair in attractive styles, wear perfume and high heels and makeup and be whatever fantasy a man wants. And the womb is a source of a woman's power and blah, 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 blah. And this stuff isn't really, like, that's not like a made up line of thinking right there. This exchange could have been ripped right out of um, Gerald Gardner, who created Wicca, right out of his early books. Or Anton LaVey, who we mentioned earlier as the creator of the first Church of Satan. In an interview with Anna Biller, uh, she confirmed that he was based on Anton LaVey and on his ideas of sexuality and women. And I bet it comes from the satanic witch. (laughs) Because that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the line of thinking throughout that entire book. So in the early days of Wicca and kind of modern occult magic, and I mean like the mid, mid 1900s, so like the 40s and the 50s and the 60s eventually, um, though women were touted as the goddesses and, and everything looked like it was very women centric, it was obvious that women were still seen as a sexual object. And although it wasn't explicitly stated, there was a lot of ways that women were still subservient to the men in charge of these occult movements. Uh, Witchcraft was practiced in the nude, even if you were underage. To join some covens, you had to have sex with the person who ran the coven. Then we have initiation ceremonies. So this isn't something, unless you're joining a very established uh, witchcraft tradition, usually Wiccan, You might not go through an initiation. If you do, it might be something that you do by yourself, where you make an oath to your own deity or to your own magic power, you know, under the full moon or something like that. But in highly ritualized Wiccan initiations, there there is this ritual called the Great Rite. And what it is, is essentially a simulated sexual coming together of the god and goddess as like one entity. And sometimes it's done by stabbing a ritual knife into a chalice, (laughs) very subtle. Uh, Sometimes it's a dramatic reenactment or a dance or a chant of some kind that builds up this energy, or sometimes it's even actual intercourse. And I want to stop for a second and say that there's nothing wrong with any of that. So if sex and having sex with other members of your coven and using sex magic, if all of that is already part of your practice and you have a coven full of other witches that are all of, you know, legal adult age, they're all aware of this in advance and everyone is okay and and doing what they want. That is totally cool. And there are covens out there that do do this. But especially in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, sex and free love not only were they all the rage, but to be cool, you were expected to be open to sexuality in any form and at any point, even if you were underage. And I'm going to keep stressing that because it happened a lot. It's no surprise that sex with the high priest was also common in initiation rituals for a lot of early Wiccans, and unfortunately, in the Love Witch. Elaine's own initiation into witchcraft was in this classic Wiccan fashion. So, We come back into the scene, and although Elaine is incredibly visibly apprehensive, uh, you know, Gayen tries to soothe her and says, I would never do anything to hurt you, and tells her to have perfect love and perfect trust. And, oh, this is where I really notice something. Everyone else at this initiation, um, save for maybe a cape, is nude. (laughs) Gayen is fully clothed. And this is something that happened multiple times. You never see Gayen in the nude. You never even see him in less than a full robe. But almost everyone around him is always nude. And that is very much a sign of 
objectification, for sure. Anyways, so during this, uh, Elaine is put up onto the altar in front of the whole coven as Gayan asked them to erect the sacred altar. In the old times, a woman was the altar and the sacred place was at the center of the circle, the origin of all things, and therefore should we adore it. Ugh. <laughs> it was really creepy. Um, and then you had the symbolic, you know, stabbing of the knife into the chalice, and it was very, like, loud and rough and harsh. And it actually makes Elaine flinch and and cry a little bit. Um, and as Gain climbs on top of her to finish the initiation, Elaine is visibly afraid and close to tears and, like, whimpering. Luckily, this is where the scene ends, but, I mean, we know how this went. And though Gayan appears at other points in the film, this is really the one that shows you exactly who he is. And it's a story that echoes the experiences that Sarah wrote in her post under the heading of The Respected Elder, also known as Samuel Wagar and the former uh, Wiccan chaplain at the University of Alberta. Here's how she describes him on her website. Every year at the local pagan festival, he would show up and leer at the young girls. He would wait until they were alone or naked and vulnerable after the nighttime skyclad ritual. He was charismatic and would tell them that he was a former politician and the high priest of a Wiccan tradition and that if they had sex with him, they were initiated into his tradition. That he made up and appointed himself the leader of. Some fell for it, and some saw him for the creeper that he was and ran away. They would range in age from 14 to 19. Sometimes he would date them. Some moved in with him for a short time before realizing what he was, a predator. Many of these women were my friends in the community. Everyone in the local community knew what he was, but no one ever called him out or kicked him out. He was no evil mastermind and mostly failed in his predatory attempts. The community would mutter and he would keep on trying to prey on young, vulnerable women. No one warned newcomers. No one called the police and no victims spoke out. And I mean, this is Gayan from the Love Witch. That's, that's exactly him. No one in Elaine's coven was looking out for her. No one cared that she was afraid, that she was apprehensive. No one seemed to think she might be a little bit vulnerable since she got into witchcraft after the suspicious death of her ex-husband right before he was supposed to get married. <laughs> no one. And Barbara, Gayan's partner and, and high priestess, I mean, she gazes at him adoringly with this big smile on her face, and then she'll preach these fe these seemingly feminist ideals, you know, about being able to rope men in with sexuality and control them, and that women are strong. And it was all very much, I've seen all of this before in real life. Even here in Windsor, there is a couple who operates this way. Though they're not quite as attractive as Barbara. Barbara was so pretty. Uh, seriously, the people in this movie are fantastic. So though most young women around here have learned to stay away, some do still fall prey to him and to the conditions of joining this coven. And those who refuse can expect an act of revenge after. It's not usually direct physical violence or anything like that, but there is, um, there is blowback for refusing to sleep with him and refusing to join his coven. It's also not specified at the beginning or anything that that's going to be a condition and the only people invited to join are young women. It's disgusting and it's horrible. And uh, it's something that those of us who know about it try to warn people of. So this is such a widespread problem and scenario. It's so real that Sarah and I on opposite ends of the country can meet the same kind of predator while Anna Biller, all the way down in California, bases her character on another popular figure, Anton LaVey, um, as well as the rituals and character traits of early Wiccan spirituality and occultism. So not just Anton LaVey, also with early Wicca with, uh, what is it, Alex Sanders and um, Gerald Gardner, there was always sexual abuse. Uh, and sexual assault. It's just rampant in the pagan community, and it always has been. The whole time modern paganism has existed, there has been this problem. Again, especially for female presenting people. But not always. So I implore you to check out Sarah's website, sarahannlawless.com, or her social media accounts, and read her post. 
Offer her your support. Share the story with all the pagans or new witches that you can. For God's sake, if you know of a predator like this, at least warn others and newcomers. Sometimes you can find members of your local community who are willing to be the bell ringers of these issues. You, you got to tell somebody. Keep an eye on your young witch friends and not just female witch friends. Male presenting witches have been posting about their own pagan sexual assault and abuse stories since I saw Sarah's post. So I believe her and all of them. I believe the accusations and I am depressingly unsurprised. Unwanted sex should never, ever be a condition of any spiritual practice. Or of anything, really. Uh, anything. Witchcraft is about true empowerment. Not empowerment that is handed to you by the same misogynistic power structures that have subjugated so many of us in the first place. So, this is just one of the ways that the love witch is very, very true to real witch life and tells very real women and witches stories while also being a very fun and gorgeous horror film. It's so great. Oh, she also uses a flying ointment. That's another reason it made me think of, of Sarah. And she makes a witch bottle. She, what does she do? She creates poppets and mojo bags. Uh, she makes candles and soaps. And she also accidentally murders a bunch of skeevy dudes. I highly recommend it. Um, Anna Biller's style very much is reflected by the like cinema of the 60s and 70s. And that's not something she did on purpose. It's just her personal style. So it's, I know it sounds really heavy with what I just talked about, but I highly recommend it. And I just couldn't ignore, I was already going to talk about this movie anyways. And then I read Sarah's posts and it was just, I couldn't ignore the correlation between the storyline of the love witch and what she was talking about. So, I know that that was a little bit heavy. That's why I saved it for the end. And it's why I had to redo this episode because originally I had this at the beginning of the episode. And let me tell you, there was no rearranging I could do to make that episode not sad the whole time. <laughs> Big problem. So in these Halloween episodes, I also like to tell a little bit of a spooky Halloween story. Last year, I read from the book of Paranormal Detectives. And this year, I thought it would be fun, since The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is starting out, to read a little excerpt of that. Of course, it's a comic book, so if you check it out yourself, you'll get a lot more out of it than you will listening to me read it. But we're gonna, I'm gonna share the story of Madam Satan and how she comes to be in Greendale. It was an accident. Two young witches in the town of Riverdale were trying to summon a succubus, a demoness of desire, to help them settle a blood rivalry. Instead, they somehow managed to set her free. From Gehenna, the capital city of hell, unless, of course, it's true what witches say. There are no accidents. We can't tell anyone what we did tonight. Not even Archie. Pinky swear? Pinky swear. Anyway, whatever that thing was, he won't live to see the morning. Not in those woods. They couldn't have been more wrong. She came across a pregnant doe and devoured it and its unborn calf. The warm meat and blood and entrails filled her. The moon was a blood moon too, and that blessed her. She was of the moon. She was of the weird woods and the salty earth and the warm cold wind that was blowing that night. She doesn't remember her name, but she remembers she had sisters once. She was meant to marry someone. Someone named Edward, 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 Edward. She almost grasps it, but then it escapes her. She does remember dimly that he, who was he, threw her over for someone else. A mortal woman, can it be? Diana, 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 Diana. Which is why she took her her life, and was consigned to Gehenna. She was betrayed. There would be a blood atonement, even if it took her years to achieve, which it might. That was all right. She had time, and she had her hatred. It sustained her in Gehenna. It would serve her here on Earth. Of course, she would need a new face first. Yeah! That's spooky as hell. I am so excited. 
As soon as I'm done this, I am no doubt going to settle in with some really gross old Halloween candy, <laughs> the molasses kisses that you get here in Canada, uh, and watch myself some Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. I'm pretty pumped about it. If you guys watch it, feel free to tell me about it. I'd, I'd love to hear what you think. So thank you so much for coming to my wonderfully spooky, very fat feminist Halloween episode. Sorry, I got a little heavy in the middle there. <laughs> if you like the show and you want to support me and the Fat Feminist Witch podcast, you can do that by going to my website at thefatfeministwitch.com and clicking on the button that says buy me a coffee. You can also go to patreon.com and join the witch and bitch for 10 bucks a month and that gets you some behind the scenes stuff and we do live meetups and we have a book club and this month we were actually reading The Chilling Advent Adventures of Sabrina. Of course you can also just find me on social media, like my page, share the links to the episodes and tell your friends about me. I'd love that. Also, if you are a witchy author or retailer, or if you have a witchy service like uh, tarot reading or Reiki, and you would like to advertise on the Fat Feminist Witch, you can do that. And you can find out more by going to advertisecast.com slash the Fat Feminist Witch. So this was our wonderful Big Fat Feminist Halloween special. Halloween is, of course, next Wednesday, October 31st. And between now and then, I still have a lot of uh, Witchcraft Without a Filter posts to post on Instagram. I have more daily Halloween tarot readings. I know I haven't done them in a couple days. I'm pretty wrapped up in this episode. And I also have a few more book reviews to post, including The Witch's Cauldron by Laura Tempest Zakroff and uh, some of Arlen Ventura's Paranormal Parlor. I'm hoping I'll be done it in time to, uh, for Halloween to share it with you guys. It's really great so far. So I hope you all have a happy Halloween and a very spooky Samhain and a very wonderful weekend. I know a lot of you will be celebrating and dressing up this weekend, and I love it. I'd love to see pictures if you want to share them. And if you want to share how you practice witchcraft or how you as a witch spend your Halloween or Samhain, you can do that using the hashtag HowRealWitchesDo. And you can do that anytime. I'm going to keep following the hashtag even after October. So if you ever want to show that off, you can. Have a wonderful weekend and wonderful Halloween, and I hope you all stay very spooky 